Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I hope you're having a good uh, end of the third week of Advent. Hard to believe it's already more than halfway done. It is, and I actually today, since this is our last uh, video before Christmas, wore a tie my children gave me uh, several years ago for Christmas, which has the 12 days of Christmas, all the 12 days of Christmas oh, very nice. symbols on it, which uh, is a very, Catholic Family News, I think, ran several stories about this years ago, but is a, the mo one of the most Catholic Christmas carols. It was actually mm -hmm. composed by the underground Catholics in uh, Protestant England, because yes. they weren't allowed to have books and things to to transmit the the true doctrine of the faith. So each of the items in the song can sound like a silly nonsense song, but really are symbols or, or messages about Catholic doctrine. Like just yes. for example, the like five code language. Yes. <laughs> yes. So like for example, the five example. gold the five gold rings are the five wounds of our Lord. Just just for example. But yes. uh, so yeah, as we're getting close to Christmas, I thought we won't be having a, a broadcast next week. We, next week and the following week being the Feast of the Circumcision, fall on since Holy Days of Obligation, we won't have a regular broadcast. So I thought I'd, in anticipation, wear wear it today. <laughs> Very nice. That's great. So uh, our topics today are going to include some uh, election 2020 updates. Monday of this week, the Electoral College met, as many of our viewers probably know, but there's actually more to the story, and Brian's going to explain that for us. We're also going to cover a, a very striking sermon that Cardinal Raymond Burke delivered uh, last weekend, uh, Saturday, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, also this week, a very explosive data leak was revealed, which shows the extent of Chinese Communist Party infiltration across the globe, a very interesting story that's still developing. Uh, also concerns about the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines, something that we, uh, we released, a our bishops released a statement on, we published on our website on Saturday, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then at the end we do have some positive legal news to share with yes. you. Uh, before we jump into all of that, we'll take a brief look at the liturgical calendar. So today is Friday, December 18th, 2020. And it is Ember Friday in the, the third week of Advent, as, as we've recalled on the show before, uh, all four times a year, the, the church traditionally celebrates what are called the Ember Days, days of special prayer and fasting uh, to correspond to the, be as Brian has explained before, the beginning of different seasons and to implore God's grace and mercy upon us uh, accordingly. And also a lot of times they're connected with uh, ordinations, for example, to the minor orders, I think, if I'm remembering yes. correctly. And then uh, the third Sunday of Advent is always a special one because it's a, a break a little bit. It's kind of a, a joyful break amidst the penitential season of Advent, Gaudete Sunday, Gaudete in Domino Semper as the introit for the Mass and the, and the beginning of the Epistle. Rejoice in the Lord always. So it's an, a nice especially this year, a much needed uh, break in, and a reminder to rejoice. A couple other feasts since our last broadcast before we get into the news. Uh, this year it fell on Sunday, so it was superseded by the Sunday, but uh, December 13th is the Feast of St. Lucy, who is an early Roman martyr who died, I think, probably as a, a teenager, if I'm remembering correctly. She was pretty young. Uh, to defend her virginity, she had offered herself as a bride to Christ. And uh, she's also one of the saints mentioned in the Roman canon after the nobis quoque, quoque peccatoribus. So yes. special saint in that regard. And then also earlier this week, December 16th, was Saint Eusebius of Vercelli and uh, was a bishop and not technically, not a uh, martyr of blood, but he did suffer greatly under the Arians. He was a fourth century bishop who was defending the divinity of Christ after the Council of Nicaea. He's not to be confused with, most people are familiar with the Eusebius of Caesarea, who was known as the father of church history. He wrote one of the church's first histories, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a look at the liturgical calendar this week, and we'll go ahead and start with our news. Uh, first up is the election 2020 update and, and where things stand. 
Yeah, interesting week. So on Monday is the date this year set by not the Constitution, but by by statute for the electors in each state who are, again, appointed directly or indirectly by the state legislatures to cast their votes. Well, we had actually some interesting surprises on Monday. Um, number one, we had so-called dual electors. So what happened was uh, the sometimes elect they're even called like dueling dueling electors. electors right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so they we had the ones who committed to vote for Biden Harris show up and cast their vote, uh, and then also the opposite slate, the slate for Trump Pence showed up, and in and actually in many state capitals they were allowed to come in and fill out the paperwork. In Michigan, the governor actually sent in like two hundred. Uh, uh, law enforcement to keep them out. <laughs> it was interesting. Uh, but they filled out their alternate ballots and both sets were set sent. Um, now this is not unheard of. Uh, this has happened in the past, uh, in 1960s, the most recent. Uh, and it now it was a state that didn't turn the election, but still Hawaii was originally certified for Vice President Nixon. Um, but the Democrats filed challenges, as President Trump has done, that there was a problem with the vote, irregularities. Uh, and so two sets of electoral votes were sent in the, quote, official one for Nixon and the unofficial one for Kennedy. Um, at the time, uh, then some court cases went on and they were opened. And actually, Richard Nixon, since he was the vice president, opened these because he's who opens the envelopes in Congress. Right, right. Uh, and it was decided that the electoral votes for Kennedy, the one who was not certified by the state, the alternate electors votes would be counted. Mm -hmm. So as recently as 1960, this has happened. So that was the first surprise. Nobody had really indicated they were going to do that. And don't worry, the missionary one, there's no rule that you have to vote in a certain place. They went to another location and did their voting. It just kind of, they're that yeah. scared that they wouldn't even let them, you know, in the building. Um, but the big surprise to me was a new state appeared on the scene. So we've been talking about, this is the Epic Times map we've been looking at of challenged states. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen all these before. We had a real surprise, New Mexico. They showed up in New Mexico and cast ballots, and a lawsuit was filed the same day uh, hmm. that go along with all the same allegations, the other lawsuits. So that's a state nobody's been really looking at before that kind of popped on the on the scene there. Um, so that was a really interesting thing. So what, what this means practically is, again, I've been saying this a long time. This is going to play out over a long period of time. Uh, the next major date is January 6th when Congress opens these and is now going to have to deal with contradictory votes from states, which is exactly what happened in 1876 when Rutherford B. Hayes was elected. There were seven states in that case, I think, that sent in double votes and mm -hmm. it had to get resolved. So if you were, again, I, we always have to not give in to like, just let this be over. Uh, you know, we want, it's better to have a good result and the correct result than just any result, right? Um, yes. We're going to have to keep waiting and praying till, just, till at least January 6th. Um, and again, another reminder, I'm not sure if I mentioned this here, that election 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes didn't know he was becoming the president until 48 hours before the inauguration. It wasn't resolved. So even though they had wow. this January 6th date, it dragged on. So again, we have to not give in to the temptation. Just, just, I'd rather just not have to worry about this. We, we want a, a good, good answer. Um, and there are, again, we get an update. If you didn't see it last Sunday on the Supreme Court's surprise decision that they didn't take the Texas case. There are many other legal cases out there from each one of these states on multiple levels, state and federal. Right. And Lynn, one of the president's lawyers, Lynn, uh, well, several of them, but Jenna Ellis did an interview uh, with Epic Times this week, this week where she said, no, this is definitely not over. Uh, we are still, you know, still pursuing these and we still need to therefore keep, keep praying um, because this is, you know, we don't know how this is going to resolve itself, but uh, it is still certainly up in the air. And as you saw, the Epic Times at least is saying, have the credibility to say, look, there's, there's, you know, this is an unusual election and there are things going on. Uh, so again, right. the fact that they did the dueling electors, the dual electors, and the fact that New Mexico kind of out of the blue joined in this is, uh, out of the blue, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> joined into this is uh, another really interesting thing. So let's, again, I think the only message here is don't give up uh, praying. Uh, because again, this th th we have to persevere, right? Sometimes our Lord makes us ask over and over again, and and to test our perseverance. So we uh, we should keep going, and we will keep you updated as as developments uh, come about. Yes, well, one person of oh, who, yeah. no ahead. surprise who's uh, who's very convinced of the outcome yes. already, <laughs> and, and wasted no time issuing another a victory speech is uh, so-called President-elect Joe Biden. 
And what I have a couple things, uh, just highlights from his speech, it was about, I don't know, 13 minutes long or something. Um, first of all, I found it interesting that he's still using the, the build back better, the, you know, the, the great reset kind of uh, verbiage. Yes. He talked about building our economy back better. So it was a little bit, um, wasn't as overt as he has done in the past, but definitely still there. But I think he's also still trying to pass himself off as a, as a good, devout, faithful Catholic. He's using biblical language like building, rebuilding on a rock, you know, obviously a, an allusion to Matthew 7, which interestingly, Pope Francis has said the same thing, all in the context yes. of building back better, <clears throat> which as we discussed a couple, I think either last week or the week before, is a gross misuse of that parable because it's not talking about building something back better. It's about building on the foundation of the rock of the word of God. Yes. And also towards the end of his speech, um, Joe Biden quoted from the, the famous prayer of St. Francis, Francis of Assisi about, you know, make me an instrument of your peace where there is doubt, uh, faith, where there is darkness, light, et cetera, et cetera. So he still seems to be pandering to Catholics and trying to pass himself off as a faithful Catholic. So, And I find this interesting as, again, another sign that, that we shouldn't give up hope because uh, if he knew this was over, if he's, oh, I'm definitely win, there's nothing going on here, why would he pander, right? Why would he? I mean, he's almost like he's campaigning still. Well, why do you need to if you won and you're in? And also another interesting fact that that reminds me of, uh, his you know, vice presidential running mate, Kamala Harris, has not yet resigned from the Senate. Now, think about that. If she's sure she's becoming the vice president, no doubt about it, nothing to see here, why not resign? Because that would give her governor time to appoint a replacement, right? Yes. So there'd be a senator there. She's hanging on to her Senate seat, even though she can't be a senator when she becomes vice president. Right. She'd have to be out of there. Contingency and when, plan. <laughs> exactly. It makes you wonder if they're worrying about a contingency plan, what does that tell you about what they really think? It's, it's interesting. But I had the same reaction. I was surprised to saw the things Matt saw. But I saw it as, wow, this sounds more like a campaign speech. <laughs> Which... Yes, and also really trying to – I think there was also some misinformation. I mean, clearly there yes. was some misinformation <laughs> in there about, you know, every case um, – that Trump, the Trump campaign has brought has been dismissed yes. on the merits, which is simply which is not true. Not true. Again, never forget that every single case has said, we're not going to look at your evidence. We're not going to consider the case on some technicality. We're going to say that we're the wrong place or you're the wrong person to look at this. And that that is important. It's right. But it's he was decided. he was but uh, he lied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was very he spent several minutes strenuously going after that point that, you know, Trump has been has taken advantage of every uh, avenue available to him and has been struck down at every turn on the merits, on the merits, yeah. on the merits. Not true. No. Yeah. All right. So our next story today uh, is from a, a prelate that we've featured before in Catholic Family News. He's probably most famous as being one of the, the four dubia cardinals, Cardinal Raymond Burke, who, as, as readers may recall, is the former prefect of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura in Rome before he was essentially sacked by Pope Francis, sidelined. Uh, he is also the founder of the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It looks like a magnificent church. I've never been there in person, but if I ever make it to Wisconsin, I'd love to visit there. Hmm. Cardinal Burke himself is a Wisconsin native. He was born and raised there and actually served as Bishop of La Crosse, Wisconsin, where the shrine is located from 1995 to 2004 uh, when he was transferred to St. Louis and was the Archbishop there for several years. So as is his custom, Cardinal Burke visits or tries to visit uh, the shrine annually and celebrate Mass there on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, December 12th. And this year, he delivered really some... Uh, some very good, very strong remarks in his sermon that speak to the situation our nation is facing. He doesn't outright talk about voter fraud, but I think it's clearly implied in this clip that we're going to play for you, the beginning of his sermon. We come to Our Lady of Guadalupe on feast day with troubled and heavy hearts. Our nation is going through a crisis which threatens its very future as free and democratic. The worldwide spread of Marxist materialism, which has already brought destruction and death 
to the lives of so many and which has threatened the foundations of our nation for decades and now seems to seize the governing power over our nation to attain economic gains we as a nation have permitted ourselves to become dependent upon the Chinese Communist Party, an ideology totally opposed to the Christian foundations upon which families and our nation remain safe and prosper. I speak of the United States of America, but evidently many other nations are in the throes of a similar, most alarming crisis. Then there is the mysterious Wuhan virus about whose nature and prevention the mass media daily give us conflicting information. What is clear, however, is that it has been used by certain forces inimical to families and to the freedom of nations to advance their evil agenda. These forces tell us that we are now the subjects of the so-called Great Reset, the new normal, which is dictated to us by their manipulation of citizens and nations through ignorance and fear. So really some extraordinary statements by the bishop there talking about yes. our nation having permitted ourselves to become dependent upon the Chinese Communist Party. That's going to be something that we're going to discuss yes. in our next story. And also bringing up the topics of the, the Great Reset and the so-called New Normal. He went on to say, quote, now we are supposed to find in a disease and its prevention, obviously referring to covid the way to understand and direct our lives. Like if this has to be the center of our existence from here on out, rather than in God and in his plan for, for our salvation. And he says further, the response of many bishops and priests and of many faithful has manifested a woeful lack of sound catechesis. So many in the church seem to have no understanding of how Christ continues his saving work in times of plague and of other diseases. So we certainly applaud Cardinal uh, Burke for his statements there. I don't know if Brian has something further he'd like to add. No, it's it's wonderful to see a bishop being a bishop, right? And not, yes. not pandering to the globalists, not speaking in double speak ambiguity, but to uh, si, si, no, no, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yes. Uh, and to call things what they are. I mean, I think that it's, it's so refreshing. Uh, very similar statements to what we've seen Archbishop Vigano say about coronavirus, mm -hmm. the takeover of the communist uh, in, in America, what's at stake. Uh, and again, this is what a bishop, this is what a shepherd does, is warn and protect the sheep. And yes. uh, it's, it was just very hard for me. I was especially glad to see him speak about this because you know, in recent months, he seems to have been keeping a more of a low profile. I know he did issue a statement in back in uh, late October in response to that video or the, what was it, the video documentary about uh, Pope Francis, Francesco, where he made those scandalous remarks about uh, yes. you know, needing a, a law for civil unions, Bishop or uh, Cardinal Burke did issue a, a written response to that, but for the most part, he's been keeping a lower profile, so it's good to see him speaking up as he did. And I just wanted to read, the before we move on, the closing paragraph where, you know, the theme of his uh, sermon turned toward Our Lady and having trust in Our Lady, just as uh, she told to uh, Juan Diego when she appeared to him, you know, am, I'm paraphrasing, am I not your mother? Uh, you know, do you, you don't have anything to worry about if I am with you, essentially because Juan Diego was concerned about the health, the failing health of his uncle, uh, Juan Bernardino, who Our Lady also appeared to on his sickbed and, and completely healed him. So Cardinal Burke ended his sermon by saying, under the loving mantle of the Immaculate Heart of Our Lady of Guadalupe, let us now lift up our heavy hearts to the glorious pierced heart of Jesus, with confidence that our Lord's promise of salvation to us will be fulfilled let us give our hearts totally to him in his holy church. Let us trust that in his heart we will find the wisdom and strength
to live in these difficult times with our eyes fixed upon him and upon the salvation which, through the divine maternity of the Virgin Mary, he brings to us in the world. So very, very good. Very good. And yes, we need to remember Our Lady of Guadalupe is our patroness here in the Americas and that she yes. appeared to cast down the forces of paganism and demo demonic. Um, that The hill on Tepeyac where uh, she appeared to Juan Diego was where stood this enormous, I mean, it was, it was as tall as a building statue of Quetzalcoatl, the serpent god. Uh, to which what you know to which was involved in the human sacrifice of the Aztecs that right. and in fact the statue was so large they couldn't destroy it uh, they couldn't you know tear it apart they literally just dug a big pit and had to like push it into the pit oh, wow. um, because it was just so massive and that's where she appears right and she crushes she who crushes the head of the serpent um, yes. so remember this as Vigano has told us, this is not just against the Chinese, I mean, against the Chinese Communist Party, but behind communism, as Pope Pius XI told us, is the anti, the spirit of the Antichrist, the devil himself. And so yes. uh, she, she crushed him in our hemisphere once before. And uh, we, you know, we, we need to keep praying particularly to her. Uh, Absolutely. So related to that, yes, we have another story that again shows, uh, we're going to, Talk, we talk a lot of people say, why are you talking about the Chinese Communist Party so much? Because it seems they have really emerged as the fulcrum, the focal point of this demonic attack uh, on Christian civilization. And uh, that is attack against the, the secular world, right, the temporal world, but also the church. We know the Vatican did a, de a disastrous capitulation to them in 2018, which they reaffirmed in 2020, sold yes. out the Episcopacy and the underground Catholics to them. We know they're caught up in the emerging information about the Vatican financial scandal, right? Lots of evidence that much money has come into the Vatican from the CCP right around the time of this um, deal. And, and again, we I did a really good interview with Elizabeth Yore this week about um, Archbishop Vigano and, and some interesting things that many people haven't noticed in his, his writings. But one of the things she talks about uh, is that, again, this connection between financial corruption and this, which you know, she really calls a coup in the church, Francis taking over. Um, she reminds us that ben when Benedict XVI was, was uh, abdicating, there had been a, a financial problem in the, in the uh, Vatican, all the ATM machines stopped, mysteriously stopped working. And none of the Vatican people that work through the Vatican and use the Vatican financial system could get any money. And then mysteriously, nobody's explained to this day, as soon as Benedict resigned, they came back on board. Uh, they started working. Now, again, as she points out, we have no, we don't know, was this part of this coup? But it was, I mean, it's very highly suspicious i would say that the timing right. of it and we do know that you know this is the way the communists operate they infiltrate with particularly with with wealth and money and uh not just the church but but everything and so we had a story break this week that that uh, brings some new light on this it came from uh an australian newspaper but i think it was reported by uh, sky news i think australia and, and they're they're not perfect they're, they're obviously a mainstream somewhat mainstream media but they're actually pretty good. If you're looking for in interesting information, if you sometimes watch their videos, they will tell you things you won't hear on the mainstream media here. Um, but here's a real brief introduction as to what, what happened this week. A register with the details of nearly party members. It includes their name, party position, birth date, national ID number, ethnicity, and in some cases, even their phone number. What's amazing about this database is not just that it exposes people who are members of the Communist Party and who are now living and working all over the world from Australia, to the US to the UK, but it's amazing because it, because it lifts the lid on how the party operates under President and Chairman Xi Jinping. But this leak shows that party branches are embedded in some of the world's biggest companies and even inside government agencies. Set up inside Western companies, allowing the infiltration of. So again, this was a data leak of a list, and she said this was clearly not something meant to be released because it's got personal contact details, but of party members who are essentially agents out there infiltrating two million of them all over the world, um, major corporations. Uh, many of them are the ones that we reported on the. Uh, 
uh, Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican last week, uh, yeah. those major companies. Also, all the major vaccine uh, companies that are producing That's what really COVID vaccines. Out to me, yeah. Yes, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. So again, it's 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 almost interesting. It's it's if they released or permitted this virus to attack us, and then they're also on the side of the supposed people creating this cure surprisingly quickly. Uh, which just, is going to be yeah. which is going to be a huge money maker for them. <laughs> billions, tens of billions, exactly. But then also in other places throughout governments that these are again. If, if, if you're a member of the Chinese part of the Communist Party, you swear an oath that the party before all else, that whatever mm -hmm. else you do, you must a report everything to the party and you must do anything they tell you to do. Right? It is a form of a secret society like Freemasonry to be a Communist Party member where you're you are body and soul property of the party and you have to do whatever they tell you embedded everywhere just today it came out over 70 people who work for new york university's uh, uh campus in shanghai china are communist uh, uh agents as so much so that the former uh chancellor of the, of the university there the university campus there was uh one of these so uh, again it's just a uh, stunning revelation of the depths and breadth of this infiltration uh, by uh, the Chinese uh, communists and, and that their goal, again, is to take over everything, to take over not just the, the church, uh, but the whole the whole uh, uh, civil society. I think and they another... have a particular interest in taking over the United States of America. Yes. And certainly there are connections to the, the election so-called irregularities and really the fraud that has taken place. Yes. And in fact, here is one of those connections, which links uh, UBS, the Chinese Dominion, and the governor, Kemp, of uh, Georgia. Yes. So the governor of Georgia, Kemp, who was, is a Republican, is bro brought down to the uh, um, M the consulate, excuse me, in Houston of the Chinese. And there's a picture of him there with Chinese officials. Immediately after going there, uh, he approves the purchase of the Dominion systems, yeah. right? Like as soon as he gets back to Georgia, which this is in 2019. Then we had released today by Lynn Wood, a uh, proof based on an SEC, that's the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filing. So this is from a government, public available government document, to which he links. Yeah that uh, $400 million purchase of stock of Dominion's holding company was made by a UBS, Union Bank of Switzerland uh, entity that appears to be controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Now, again, there's a lot of details to get to that. I won't go through all of them, but essentially we know that UBS is the one who bought, and it's not the main bank UBS. It's a private limited liability company with the name of UBS, but as a private company, they don't tell us who owns them. We just know their name, right? So it's possible they're, you know, we don't know who they're owned by. They don't disclose that. We do know that the main bank, Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS, has a joint venture with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they, they had to agree to this to be allowed to do business in China. We know they have that. Mm -hmm. What we do know about this UBS entity that bought $400 million worth of stock in Dominion is that three of its four directors appear to be Chinese nationals. Now, again, I haven't, no people, there's 2 million names on that list. I'm not sure if anybody's cross-referenced to see if they are on the list, because this mm -hmm. just broke recently, but are clearly Chinese nationals. So again, interestingly, when the head of Dominion testified in front of Michigan this week, he swore under oath that their Dominion was 100% owned by Americans and there's no foreign involvement. Mm -hmm. But again, we now know this owner, who he claims is just a New York LLC, which is true. I could, you know, people from overseas could form a company in New York and it'd be a New York company. But right. if it's owned by all foreign people, it's a foreign, all intents and purposes, foreign company. But we know that three of the four directors are, appear to be foreign, not US citizens, they're Chinese. Um, and, and again, so we know that he didn't tell the whole truth at least about that. Um, but there is this now this clear, deep connection. Uh, again, there's more detail to explain that connection, but having looked at it and looked at the filings, there is very strong evidence that 400 million was funneled from China through UBS to have control over Dominion. Uh, and then Dominion also, with the help of the Chinese, it appears, 
um, who were who intervened to talk to the governor uh, were involved in this rollout of the, the system. I will just add, unrelated, if you watch the hearings where this guy testified, the head of Dominion, CEO, it was, it was just blatant lies under oath. I'll just give you a real quick example. They said, well, it's been alleged that your machines can be connected wirelessly to the internet. So they could be interacting with the internet without people seeing it. He absolutely said, that's absolutely not true. Well, you can go on the internet and you can see, first of all, their operating manual talks about how to connect them wirelessly. And then you can see videos of their, the salespeople for Dominion uh, where they, the person saying, well, we want to buy this. Can we connect it to the internet wirelessly? And they say, you can use any modem you want, wireless, wired. Hmm. We can set it up any way you want. So again, uh, this guy clearly, I mean, clearly lied about both no connection to- And if he's in charge of the company, there's no way that he couldn't know that. Uh, exactly. There's no way that he couldn't know that. Uh, and so uh, this this is really interesting. I haven't been able to get full access to the list. I'd find, I'd like if somebody can, you know, please, anybody who can get access, see if the Vatican or any church offices are listed as places where some of these people work. I would find that um, yes. highly interesting, yes. interesting to know. And something else related just before, <laughs> very briefly before we move on, you know, something else we need to keep our eyes on, especially as uh, January 6th, the counting of the electoral college ballots comes and, uh, you know, who knows who's going to be inaugurated January 20th, but you know, let's not forget the connection of the Biden family to all of this Chinese communist yes. party corruption. as well. First statement made in months by Hunter Biden reads as follows. I learned yesterday, so the, the Feast of, Art of the Immaculate Conception, for the first time, who knows if that's true, that the U.S. Attorney's <laughs> Office in Delaware advised my legal counsel also yesterday that they are investigating my tax affairs. I take this matter very seriously. I'm sure you do. <laughs> you should. You should. But, but I am confident that a professional and objective review of these matters will demonstrate that I handled my affairs legally and appropriately, including with the benefit of professional tax advisors. Well, it's all going to depend on who's sitting in the Oval Office, really. I mean, do we yes. honestly think that he's going to be objectively and professionally investigated if his father is the commander-in-chief? Not very likely. No, not very likely. And so, again, remember, Pius XI told us the only system form of organization of the civil society that is intrinsically evil, irredeemable, cannot be dealt with in terms of cooperation is communism. Uh, again, there can be perversions of other systems that you know, are just neither good nor bad. They could be good, they can be bad, they can have bad things, but is the only one that, again, we have been told by the church, and this is the system advanced by uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And so it is not surprising that they are the forefront of, of the as Archbishop Lefebvre, excuse me, Vigano would say, mm -hmm. uh, the children of darkness. And this connection between the embedded people and the vaccine makers really leads us into our, our next topic uh, that Matt's going to introduce. Yes. So this whole issue of the COVID vaccines and, and what I like to call a real presidential paradox in all of this yes. that, that we're going to talk about in just a moment. But uh, as an in by way of introduction, uh, if you haven't already looked at it, I highly recommend reading, and it's on our website. Brian has it displayed right now. So our headline for it is, One Cardinal and Four Bishops Teach Clearly That Catholics Must Refuse Vaccines Tainted by Abortion. So it's not that we are, you know, so-called anti-vaxxers and we're completely opposed, you know, in general to vaccines, but we are opposed to participating in abortion, even if it's remote participation, uh, we don't want to be connected in that chain in any way to tainted cell. And what we're talking about is cell lines of children who were aborted decades ago, but have been preserved in laboratories and used as specimens in research and even in the actual development of the vaccines themselves in some cases. So on December 12th, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, Cardinals from, let me pull this down. One here. cardinal, yeah. Yes, one cardinal from, um, I believe he's a uh, cardinal, uh, Archbishop Emeritus of Riga in Latvia, mm -hmm. and then also the current Metropolitan Archbishop of uh, the Archdiocese, Archdiocese of St. Mary in Astana, Kazakhstan, Tomasz Pita, uh, another um, Emeritus prelate from uh, 
Kazakhstan as well. I think the former, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so both of these are connected to, our, uh, to Bishop Athanasius Snyder, who's an auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of St. Mary in Astana, Kazakhstan. It's also signed by a fifth prelate uh, from the United States, Joseph Strickland, who is the current bishop of Tyler, Texas. And I find it interesting with the exception of Bishop Strickland, uh, all of these other prelates come from former communist countries, countries yes. that were persecuted under the Soviet. Yeah. Under the Soviet. So again, they, they know, and we know from Bishop uh, Athanasius Snyder's biography or self-biography, autobiography in Christus Vincit, uh, he lived under Soviet rule and escaped. So he knows these are people who speak with knowledge of the yes. plans of communists. So again, they I think that's what communism looks like. They know yes. what, how it's implemented. They know what it feels like, and they can see it happening yes. before their very eyes yes. through this COVID pandemic. Yes. So interestingly, they, again, please look at the video where if you, you don't have time to read it, I read out the text. You can listen to it or read it on the website because they, again, make very clear. And their point, again, is uh, that, okay, the Vatican has said it's okay to use vaccines. They haven't spoken, the Vatican hasn't directly spoken on this one, but in the past, it's okay to use other vaccines because we know there are many others that have a uh, connection to abortion. But they just say, this seems to be wrong. This seems to be, if, if abortion is so fundamental and fundamental because it, it, it it's, goes to the very core, right? Without life, without being, you, you cut off all other natural and supernatural things. Right? You, you cannot be baptized if you are killed by abortion. You cannot receive the sacraments. You cannot receive your first communion, right? All these just on the supernatural level. Um, so that's why if it is so fundamental, how is it that we can compromise with it, right? And again, they don't deny the principle that there are some things that may have some connection to evil that is so remote that, again, we, we just have to you know, be involved with it. And again, one example might be a medicine produced by a, 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 co a company that does do immoral research. So maybe it does immoral research using aborted babies, but you're taking you know, penicillin or something that has no connection to abortion. Okay, there is a connection. You're buying from a company. But again, I think even these prelates would say, okay, that's something that, yeah, under this principle, it's not, you're not really involved in that. But what they seem to be saying is, look, this is a matter of prudence. How do we apply the principle? And in the case of abortion, it's such a grave evil that this connection, we just, we just, we should be willing to stand up and say, we will not. This is so important that this we're not going to deal with. Now, right. um, you, little facts. Again, they didn't get into the specific facts, uh, but LifeSite News has stepped in to provide uh, some really good information uh, about which COVID vaccines are connected to abortion. Right. Um, so again, you can read this. But what's important about is the connected to. They explain there's sort of two issues. Uh, there's three types of vaccines that, that that have been identified. Some that have absolutely no connection to abortion. They were not involved in. They did not use any anything that comes from an abortion in any way. There's one set that the vaccine itself is produced from cells, as Matt explained, that come from and have been derived from uh, babies that were killed through abortion. That, so the actual production making of the vaccine come from it. And then this third category is something that uses cells that are not connected to abortion. And again, this, this is not, people say we have to use abortion. It's not true. Uh, they can, if they have to use certain types of cells, stem cells, for example, they can come from cord blood. You can have people donate their cord right. blood uh, from the umbilical cord that the, you know, and, and uh, use those cells. So they do that properly. But then when it came time to test the vaccine, they did use cells derived from aborted children in the testing. Uh, right. And again, they, they, the conclusion that I think LifeSite makes uh, and that some other organizations like Child of God for Life is that that is therefore connected to abortion um, in the testing. But but um, again, that might be an area, I don't the bishops didn't address this particularly, but an area where there's room for discussion on how the principle operates, right? Everyone here agrees with the principle that you cannot directly cooperate with evil. You can sort of be forced to come in proximity to evil and still engage in and as long as it is remote enough etc it, it everybody agrees on that principle but whenever you're applying a principle there are different factual situations and there is room for and again as bishops we have to take their opinion on applying the principle to facts more seriously because they have the grace of state but even among bishops this is not an infallible declaration that the right. pfizer vaccine or that vaccine right this is 
uh, using the infallible infallibly divine principles to, to reach a practical conclusion. So again, I think there is, even among these bishops, there may be room for debate. Is testing what they're talking about, or is it uh, clearly they're saying the, the Pfizer is one, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca is another, that, uh, excuse me, not Pfizer, I misspoke. Moderna. Moderna. Moderna is one that is clearly views from abortion. The Pfizer one is the one that just tested, as far as we're told. So again, there's where there is room for, I, I, again, maybe some disagreement on the application of the principle. The testing may be remote enough. I, again, I don't know. I don't know what the bishop's position is. I didn't get into this nitty gritty, but we do want to be careful. I, I think we applaud these bishops for their their courage in saying, look, let's not play games here, right? If, right. Let's, if this if is I so important. I could read important. a brief statement yes, from good. their, um, from their Please. read a brief Please. quote rather from their statement. This kind of gets to the heart of it, yes. what Brian is describing. They say, quote, we are living through one of the worst genocides known to man. Millions upon millions of babies across the world have been slaughtered, and it's probably more like billions at this point in their mother's wombs. And day after day, this hidden genocide continues through the abortion industry, biomedical research and fetal technology, and a push by governments and international bodies like the World Economic Forum, like the Bill Gates Foundation, et cetera. That's me, my commentary there, to promote such vaccines as one of their goals. And they go on to say, now is not the time for Catholics to yield to do so would be grossly irresponsible. The acceptance of these vaccines by Catholics on the grounds that they involve only, quote, a remote, passive, and material cooperation of, uh, with evil would play into the hands of the church's enemies and weaken her as the last stronghold against the evil of abortion. Yes. And again, that's very important because a lot of people have attacked them and said, oh, you're denying church teaching on material cooperation evil. They're not, right? They're saying, look, we're looking at this practically and saying, look, whatever that teaching would say very technically on this, this is so grave and such a grave genocide that we just think to, to stand up and defend the higher principle on, on the uh, intrinsically evil nature of abortion, voluntary abortion, we have to do this. We, we need to stand up. If I may take from their analogy, maybe a way they might say it. So in the letter, they mention this analogy. Um, if there's slave labor that's used to produce something, that moral theologians in the past had said you are able to purchase it as long as you don't want slavery. You're not in favor of slavery but you or exploitation of people, but you could purchase it. I think what they might say, for example, is, okay, that's true, but if there is some oppression that is greater so it's not just slavery but it's brutal slavery that's it's like maybe like say concentration camps uh, right. and it's so widespread it's it's more people that they might say look in that case even though that principle might lead to that conclusion potentially this is so evil that and so widespread that we we have to rise above that and not just say okay I'm, i've got a technicality so again maybe if that helps people understand a little bit about the approach they're taking um but Having explained that, again, please see the report for more. Uh, Matt has pointed out, I think, an issue we need to deal with because we've talked a lot about President Donald Trump being the most pro-life president in history. And Matt's going to talk about, again, a little contradiction here or, or paradox. Right. So, right, exactly. So so we know that pro, uh, President Trump is very pro-life, as Brian just mentioned. And even this week, there was a report that came out from uh, lifenews.com. The headline reads, Trump will withhold $200 million in tax in tax dollars from California for forcing Christians to fund abortions. So clearly the president is against abortion. He's shown that time and again in various yes. ways. So the, the paradox is why has he allowed Operation Warp Speed, which is the government program, you know, producing the vaccine to contract with companies, some of which we named, you know, Moderna, AstraZeneca, even Pfizer to some degree, who use tainted cell lines for vaccine development in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And actually this week, uh, a very well-known pro-life leader who's been a, a staunch defender of President Trump actually did uh, voice some concern about this via Twitter. Uh, many of our readers may be familiar with Lila Rose, who runs a live action apostolate, which is devoted to exposing the abortion industry. She started it as a teenager, actually, making undercover mm -hmm. videos similar to the work that uh, David Delayden does. Mm -hmm. So here's what she tweeted out earlier this week with 
uh, Vice President Pence and President Trump actually tagged in the tweet, hoping they would see it. Quote, nearly all the COVID vaccines are being created either with aborted babies or being attested or being tested on aborted babies. And what she means is the cells of children right. who were aborted decades ago. I don't expect pro-abort bank rollers to care, but where was the supervision by the pro-life government entities backing this question mark? This is an atrocity. So she is kind of calling out the administration and at, you know, pointing out this paradox, this contradiction and asking what is going on here. But Brian was gonna offer a few uh, possible answers to that question. So, and, and ultimately, I think it's a good question. I think I'm glad she raised it. Uh, we don't have a direct answer, but I can, I can speculate two possibilities. I mean, I think one, to me, there's even a larger sort of issue here because President Trump has been sort of very cautious on vaccines generally. And he's been very much of the view that nobody should have any vaccine, should be forced to take any vaccine. And that people, if they have an objection for medical or moral or religious reasons should you know, not have to do it. Um, so it is a little odd that somebody who's sort of that unconventional position would be so gung-ho for vaccines. So the one answer may be that I think he may be using this whole vaccine issue to expose the hypocrisy of the Great Reset uh, globalists who want to use the pandemic for their purposes. Again, maybe they created it, maybe they didn't, but if they didn't, they want to use it. And I do think that's why, like, why did he push vaccines so hard? He also clearly tells us he thinks this is a treatable disease, that you don't need a vaccine because you can get cured with medicines. Um, so again, why this warp speed on the vaccines? So the explanation is he wants to expose their hypocrisy because what they told us in the beginning is you're going to have to lock down. This is hugely dangerous. We're going to have to wait till we get a vaccine. Why? Because they thought that would take two years and then we, they could lock us down for two years and destroy the economy and destroy everything. Including um, the Trump administration. Including the Trump administration. <laughs> and so what did he do? He's like, okay, well, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to, again, let you, I'm going to sort of make this the vaccine that you say you need come out really quickly to sort of expose you. And he's actually done that this week. And I'm not gonna play the clip because we're running short on time, but Dr. Fauci went on video and said, hey, this vaccine's out. But by the way, if you get vaccinated, you're still gonna need to wear a mask. You have to social distance. Nothing's gonna change. Lockdown's needed mm -hmm. until at least through 2021 because the vaccine may not work and it may, you'll still be trans. You still, even though you have the vaccine, you'll be getting people sick. Now again, this is the guy that's told us vaccines are the silver bullet for everything. So again, I think if that was all Trump was doing, maybe he was saying, look, I know they're going to do this anyway. They're going to use abortion. I'm just going to push them to do it sooner. They're going to do it anyway, but I'm going to push them to do it sooner to expose them. Maybe. And again, there, he doesn't really want the abortion, but he's sort of letting them hang themselves. Maybe. Um, now with that, what I do find interesting is that Trump announced when just this week, when the vaccine started, he said on Twitter, I'm not taking the vaccine and I've changed the, apparently they were going to issue it to the, all the white house people first. Right. He said, I've changed it so they're not getting it first. I'm not receiving it. And he said, I would receive it at an appropriate time, which is a very weird way to word <laughs> it, right? I mean, because yeah. it's almost like, and again, he's a very smart guy. If he thinks it's not appropriate ever, he'll never, <laughs> again, I don't know. <laughs> but I find it weird that he pushed the vaccines, but then said, well, I'm not taking it right now. Um, so that may be one explanation. Another may be that this distinction, first of all, we were talking about between and again, it's understanding the facts. He knows abortion is bad and he's willing to take real practical things to stop connections to abortion, right? Withhold $200 million. That, that's a real practical thing. But again, maybe he either doesn't understand or isn't fully informed or doesn't understand that there, you, know, you could conclude testing with it is uh, a, a use of abortion, right? Is, is morally problematic. Again, we, we don't know what's in his mind, but that's a possibility. Some evidence for that came out today um, because although the White House was sort of put off track, the vice president did receive, apparently, uh, there's a public picture and a public kind of event, a coronavirus vaccine today. And there you see him supposedly, again, we're told getting it. But what's interesting about it is when he announced that, he said that he was specifically receiving the version of the vaccine that does not have a connection to abortion. 
the mm -hmm. Pfizer vaccine, which is the one, as I told you earlier, that was related to testing. Now, mm -hmm. again, Pence has been also very, through his whole career, not even before Donald Trump, very right. pro-life. The most, he's the one that as a governor signed a law that said you had to bury aborted children in cemeteries, right? right. That, that, again, very, very pro-life and understanding that. So again, that suggests to me that at least he, and maybe he's the one explaining it to the president, d again, just doesn't, does it, you know, doesn't either doesn't understand the connection to abortion or um, thinks, okay, that's so remote that it's not really connected to abortion because he clearly doesn't want to be connected to abortion or he would have just taken the Moderna one and said, no big deal. So he clearly mm -hmm. understands the moral issue as the bishops explain it. So again, maybe that's, and maybe it's a combination of both, right? Trump knows they're going to do it. And, but he wants to make sure there's an available alternative that he thinks is morally acceptable. Which, which could be this. Um, but also remember what he's always said, even with this, he's been very insistent. No, if anybody has a moral issue with this, they do not. I will never require them to take it. Whereas the Democrats are talking about mandatory vaccination of everybody. And that's what they've done in New York for other vaccines. They've made it that are abortion connected, uh, made it mandatory. So uh, it is, we don't know. I think the president owes us an answer to explain. And again, maybe we disagree with him. Maybe he'll say, I think the Pfizer one is not connected enough to abortion. We might disagree with that, but that's an understandable position. It doesn't mean he's not pro-life. It means he understands the facts differently. Um, but I think he does owe us an answer and, and it, it is troubling. Um, and we'd like to hear more. And just as a closing statement for this story, before we close up, uh, we have one more of the, the legal victory story, but one statement from the, the bishop's statement on all of this that really struck me as profound. They say, bodily health is not an absolute value. Yes. Obedience to the law of God and the eternal salvation of the souls must be given primacy. Vaccines derived from the cells of cruelly murdered unborn children are clearly apocalyptic in character and may possibly foreshadow the mark of the beast from the book of the apocalypse. And it, it, it will be interesting to see, you know, if people morally object to taking the vaccine, is that going to uh, essentially ostracize them from civil society? I certainly hope it doesn't come to that, but we'll see what happens in the coming weeks and months. Mm. Yes. All right. So our final story today is a, a positive story. One on a positive note, a couple of legal victories for the church against COVID restrictions, against COVID regimes uh, in various areas of the country. One of which, well, actually both of which involve our good friend and colleague, uh, Christopher Ferrara and his legal work. So I'll let Brian go ahead and take us through these. Yes. So as we reported previously, the, uh, uh, Supreme Court decided in a case the Archdiocese of uh, New York, of Brooklyn, excuse me, against the government. Uh, they struck down New York's restrictions on uh, in-person religious uh, services, uh, and, and uh, that were basically saying no matter how big your building, you know, you have a cathedral, it can seat a few thousand, you can only have ten people there or right. none at all. Who are uh, socially distanced? <laughs> socially distanced, yeah. Uh, struck down as unconstitutional. The Supreme Court said even in a pandemic, supposedly pandemic. Pandemic, you cannot just suspend the the, the law and person and close the church down, particularly when you're letting you know unrestricted numbers of people go into Home Depot or places. Right. Um, so what happened then after that case, uh, they there was a lower court judge in California. So Father Burfitt, a Society of St. Pius X priest who operates, uh, I think, seven missions or so, seven churches around California uh, right. with, with other priests, who, who he's the prior, he's in charge of them. Uh, he sued the governor of California. And in that case, a lower court judge said, whoa, now the Supreme Court said that I'm issuing an injunction ordering California to let you have mass. And it was issued right before last Sunday's mass. Um, so he just sort of gave up that that judge and said, I guess the Supreme Court has spoken. And so he won his case. Uh, and then in uh, New Jersey, our good friend, and that was, he was represented by the Thomas More Society and our good friend, Christopher Ferrara. Uh, yes. Chris Ferrara also has a case in New Jersey uh, that we've spoken about for Father uh, Robinson, uh, who, Father Kevin Robinson, yes. uh, who sued uh, and uh, um, 
for the same kind of issue, right? Restrictions. Right. Uh, Chris, and Father Robinson was actually interviewed by Tucker Carlson on Fox News about this. Mm -hmm. uh, together with, he kind of got together with some uh, Orthodox uh, Jews who were also saying, well, let's share our legal fees, right? Get together, or not fees, because right. Chris is doing it for free, but the costs to the court, because you have to, even though the lawyer may do it for free, there's still costs. Right. So they got together. Uh, the Supreme Court, together with another case unrelated to Chris in Colorado, uh, uh, that was representing Protestants, the Supreme Court intervened and overturned the lower court cases uh, that had upheld the government restriction and said, hey, you guys, uh, you can't do that because we ruled, remember in this other case, you can't have these restrictions. So they outright uh, overruled them and said, you're free to have your religious services. So Father Robinson and his churches. Um, if you remember also, Chris also won uh, successfully in New York against uh, the, the for against the government. We reported this previously for Father Stephen Seuss, uh, who operates churches again for the site of St. Pius X in uh, New York. Uh, so great victory churches from coast to coast reopened uh, thanks to the great work of the Thomas, among some others, because again, a few cases are not Chris's, um, mm -hmm. but St. Thomas More Society and Chris Ferrara. And uh, LifeSite News interviewed Chris uh, recently to talk about these victories. And there's a little interesting clip I want to show you. So we're going to pick this up where John Henry had just asked him about, um, the, like, were the bishops behind this? Did they join your suits, like in New Jersey, California? Uh, we, we do know the bishop in Brooklyn did have their own suit. Uh, but he says, well, you know, what kind of what's going on with the, the suits you were involved in? Were, were all the bishops supporting you? And here's Chris's answer. Rather embarrassing that the mainstream church has refrain from launching challenges to COVID-19 restrictions on divine worship in churches and cathedrals. Not only that, <laughs> they've gone beyond what the state requests. They seem quite eager to give to Caesar not only what, what is Caesar's, but what is God's. They're bending over backwards, operating under capacity limits that are beyond even what the state requires, and they just don't seem to be willing to challenge the power of the state. So in representing claimants in these cases, We've had to go to people who have the hardihood to stand up and say no. And that includes an interesting parallel of plaintiffs. We have, on, on one hand, Orthodox Jewish members of various Orthodox Jewish communities. And we have priests of the Society of St. Pius X. So in all three cases, these so-called outliner outliers are the ones who have launched the, the successful claims. So again, really, really interesting, and I think, you know, and they, they do, before the clip you heard, commend the bishops in Brooklyn, right, for, for standing up, and that's great. We do the, you know, the same thing as we commend Bishop Strickland for being the only U.S. bishop to talk about the vaccines. That's great, but he's sort of asking, yeah, well, but that's one diocese among hundreds in the United States, right? Where are the others? And in fact, when we started the cases, say, where were they? Why didn't they say, hey, it's a great idea, we'll join you, you know, when, when Orthodox Jews, who again, have a lot less connection to us than the bishops said, right. yeah, let me, let me get on board with you. I, I let's work. And they joined the suit. Uh, he added them in. Uh, he's saying, you know, where are the bishops? And his point is really important. I mean, these are great victories and we congratulate them against the, the new world order state, um, which need to be done. But he reminds us they're not the only problem. He's saying, even in states where we've won victories or where the government didn't impose any restriction, the bishops are, are, are the bad guys. They're the ones who are imposing, even if there's a rule, they're imposing stricter rules than the government, or if there's no rules at all. And I saw this here in Florida, where I am. Yep. The, the government didn't shut a single church. In fact, the governor made clear churches are exempt from all these orders. But aside from traditional priests, his, who are his plaintiffs, all of his Catholic plaintiffs are traditional mass priests. Every church in Florida was shut down. Not by order of the governor, but by order of the bishop. And so in his celebration, he points out something that is really, you know, amazing. We're not just fighting a communist socialist governors who are trying to persecute the church, but it's a persecution from within. The yes. agents, the agents, I use that not sorry, directly, not saying bishops are members of the Chinese Communist Party, but their kind of agents or tra fellow travelers have infiltrated even into the church. And, and that's a really powerful point. It's like the, the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita that our friend, yes. uh, dearly departed yes. friend, John Venari, God rest his soul, reported on so well that yes. it's not that they necessarily want active Freemasons among the hierarchy, but they want men whose minds have been corrupted by Freemasonic ideas and principles who are willing to cooperate with the revolution. 
Yes, and, and we congratulate them and celebrate this victory. Uh, it will mean real things for real people. I know somebody that was here in Florida who lives and goes to one of Father Burfitt's chapels in uh, California, but he, he has some rep friends out here. He came out here. He's like, I need to go to mass. I need, he flew across the country. Tra I don't know if he flew, traveled across the country. And I saw him. He's like, well, I think I can go home now because my, my churches are open. So again, whatever these bad news, there at least are several churches from coast to coast, which ha are offering mass now for the public. Thanks to this, this perseverance of uh, Chris and the St. Thomas More Society. Yes. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our news roundup for this week. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us again. And as always, uh, please like the video, uh, share it with your family and friends. Do remember that we are on uh, a new platform now. Our videos rumble um, because as we reported last week, there's a lot of big tech censorship going on. And it's probably only a matter of time, especially as we continue to say, uh, unpopular and unwanted truths on our show uh the big brother is watching and will probably be censored at some point so we do ask for your continued support uh make please like the video share it with family friends and ultimately if you enjoy this free content that we make available through our our video apostolate on our website uh, please do support us in the form of a subscription to our monthly newspaper catholic family news and uh, as the holidays, you know, we approach the holiday season, uh, please consider purchasing gift subscriptions for family and friends. It makes a great gift uh, and it's a great way of a tool of evangelization to spread the faith, our monthly paper and, and get it circulating among more people. I don't know if Brian had anything he wanted to add to that. No, just please help us uh, either subscribing or again, incredible help forwarding this around so that more and more people can, can get this content. So please uh, do your part. Yes. And we'll close as we do uh, with the Archbishop Vigano's prayer for a resurgence of Christianity in America and for the reelection of Donald Trump, which I realize at this point seems um, definitely a long shot, but God throughout salvation history is known for uh, doing what seems to be impossible, making the impossible possible. So we continue to pray for that outcome in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, King of kings and Lord of lords, graciously turn your gaze to us who invoke you with confidence. Bless us, citizens of the United States of America. Grant peace and prosperity to our nation. Illuminate those who govern us so that they may commit themselves to the common good in respect for your holy law. Protect those who, defending the inviolable principles of the natural law and your commandments, must face the repeated assaults of the enemy of the human race. Keep in the hearts of your children courage for the truth, love for virtue, and perseverance in the midst of trials. Make our families grow in the example that our Lord has given us, together with his most holy mother and St. Joseph in the home of Nazareth. Give to our fathers and mothers the gift of strength to educate wisely the children with which you have blessed them. Give courage to those who, in spiritual combat, fight the good fight of faith as soldiers of Christ against the furious forces of the children of darkness. Keep each one of us, O Lord, in your most sacred heart, and above all, him whom your providence has placed at the head of our nation. Bless the President of the United States of America, so that, aware of his responsibility and his duties, he may be a knight of justice, a defender of the oppressed, a firm bulwark against your enemies, and a proud supporter of the children of light. Place the United States of America and the whole world under the mantle of the Queen of Victories, our unconquered leader in battle, the Immaculate Conception. It is thanks to her and through your mercy that the hymn of praise rises to you, O Lord, from the children whom you have redeemed in the most precious blood of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. And we will now turn uh, to a shorter prayer. Uh, there's a prayer that was uh, specifically written uh, to defeat the Marxists, and was a good one to which John Venari, our friend, our uh, predecessor, was deep, to deeply devoted. Eternal Father, I offer thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou mayest put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved son hath said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Fatima. Pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, wish everyone a blessed, holy, peaceful, happy Christmas. Remember, Christmas isn't a day, it's a season. Uh, we have the eight days, the octave, and then the 12 days, and then the full sort of 40 Christmas Epiphany season. Uh, so let's, uh, again, Catholics, you got to fast and do penance when it's time to do fast and do penance, and we need to celebrate when it's time to be celebrated. I know it's hard. Yes. We covered a lot of difficult stories. But Christmas is a time of joy. And as, as uh, St. Paul tells us, we must be joyful even in the midst of our tribulation. So yes. uh, let's, let's show the world that uh, the truth and the children of light, although they fight hard, we have to keep fighting, we do celebrate with joy uh, yes. the mysteries of our, our redemption. Because so, ultimately we know the war is already won. Yes. So don't lose sight of that. Enjoy your Christmas. Uh, unless something urgent comes up that we want to bring to you, we'll do a special report. But if not, we will see you uh, on uh, January 8th, which will be uh, the uh, first day after the two great holy days. Yes. Thank God you. God bless you and have Merry a Christmas. Christmas. Ich bin die Sonne, 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 Sonne.